All right, Joe, we're back with Joe Collins running for the 43rd Cong Congressional District here in, in uh, at Los Angeles against Maxine Waters. Um, why do you think you're the man to take their job? Well, um, the, the position is going to have to get filled. The job is going to have to get done regardless. And especially as a young person, we need a fresh face. We need like new ideas in, in Congress as well as new ideas of how we build our community. And from my perspective, it's, it's not getting done. It hasn't been getting done for a very long time. Now, 29 years in, in office, almost 30 years in office, is a very long time to, to hold the seat. But I think it's time to pass that torch. And if you don't want to pass it, then it's going to have to be taken by force because we need opportunities. We need development. We need to rebuild our schools. Um, we need to bring more jobs in. And this is something that has not been happening for a very long time. And I don't want to continue to wait to, uh, to, to get what we deserve when it comes to opportunities and representation that we need in our district. Now, why are you, why are you running as a Republican? I, that's that's got to be a question I got to ask. <laughs> yeah, so for me, um, I'm running as a Republican because I am a Republican. I became a Republican in 2004 whenever I joined the military. The main reason why is because the history of black men getting into politics um, being Republican, and I thought that was, you know, pretty amazing knowing what the Democratic Party has been doing to black people for a very long time. So it was the history of the Republican Party that, that got it for me. That's what it did for me. And, and I love the bravery of the, of the man who first got into politics. And so the Republican Party was who they chose. For, so for me, it's like going back to the roots of where black men started when it came to getting into politics. All right. Um, I saw you out there in the streets. You, you had your shovels and your rakes and your brooms cleaning up the city. What would you do at, if you, what happened if you won, man? What, what, if, what happened if something happened and you just happened to make this happen? What, what's, your, what's your first hundred days? What would you do? Well, I do what we what we started to do already. One thing that I wanted to do was uh, when we got into this race, I wanted to run and work as if I was already in Congress. So I want to continue to bring, you know, quality jobs. We've been working with the aerospace industry down there, Hawthorne and the airport to be able to buy quality jobs that people don't need degrees for. You can get internships and journeyman, uh, journeymanships in order to work in the aerospace industry. So we're working with that. We got a program that we got, this, we got uh, sponsored by NASA to put into our high schools, but we also created a plan to rebuild our high schools and redesign the type of education that's going to improve our children's uh, chances of success. Um, also rebuilding the infrastructure. I know Opportunity Zones got signed into law and this is supposed to be for people to be able to reinvest in the communities, but that hasn't been happening um, either due in part from the uh, amount of things that are going on with the city council members and um, getting financial literacy back. That's absolutely important. I hear a lot of times, especially in the younger generations, well, we need to start building, we need to start building generational wealth, but nobody has ever taught us how to build generational wealth. And so I'm going to bring that back as, long, as well as, um, rebuilding the relationship between the law enforcement and communities. Now we have like, you know, the, the this anti-cop thing going around when the police is not the problem. The issue is we have legislators who have failed to pass um, viable legislation that is going to improve our quality of life. Or they failed to remove legislation that's been very hurtful to our communities. Like I'll give you an example. I just got finished reading all 338 pages of the Joe Biden's crime bill that he wrote. He specifically wrote it and he's proud about it. This crime bill incentivized the, the arrest and incarceration of blacks and Latinos or people who live in inner cities by providing grants and, uh, and cash incentives to arrest people and throw them in jail on assumptions of a crime committed without even having evidence. And I think that's atrocious. Now, when you ask me as a black man growing up in the inner cities and then from the outside looking in at everything that's been going on, with the, with the police and with the gangs in our neighborhoods, I have to think that this is one of the, one of the bills that is being used that allows the cops to do what they do, but get away with the things that they get away with. Now, I, I'm not um, anti-cop because I was in the military. I'm pro-law enforcement. I think there's a right way and a wrong way to do everything in order to correct the wrongs that's been done to our community. We have to get rid of those bills that they use that specifically designed to attack us. Now, when, uh, yes, normally I do my show on Tuesdays. You couldn't make it yesterday. I had something else to do. So I announced on Facebook I was going to have it on Wednesday and today at this time. I caught a lot of flags behind that, okay? <laughs> I apologize. Uh, being that you are a Republican, uh, quote, unquote, a Trump supporter, <laughs> I, that this, this community is predominantly uh, Democratic. 
And yeah. um, it's been that way for a long time. How do you think you persuade people to change that that particular the party alignment and do something totally different? I'm quite sure, knowing politics like I do in in, in I've seen that I've seen over the years, Maxine has probably groomed somebody that's ready to take her slot once she decides to sit down and jump into a rocking chair. How do you plan on? Uh, and it probably won't be this year. I, don't, I, see, I see she's going stronger again this year. What do you? What would if you don't win this year? What would you do next time? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll run again. Um, but when it comes to being a Trump supporter, the thing about it is, I, I served thirteen and a half years in the U.S. Navy. I support every single president because they're the president of the United States, and that's what we were taught to do. Um, it's not my job to flip anybody and turn them into a Republican. Uh, I think that the political party preference is your own personal choice. And if you respect God and you respect God's ability to give people the right and ability to make their own choice, then you have to respect people's choice. Plus, I don't get paid to do it. I used to be a recruiter for the U.S. Navy, and I was a really good one. Um, so I don't want to turn people into a, a Republican. And if you ask people why you're a Democrat, I don't think they can honestly tell you why they're Democrat. I don't think people can tell you something that the Democratic Party has done to improve the lives of black and brown people in our communities. Because I'll be honest, it hasn't happened. I've looked, I've done the research, and I don't, I don't see anything. Even when we have Barack Obama, who was a black man as a um, president, he didn't do much for our community either. He did a lot for the LGBTQ community, which is, which is great, but we elected him into office. And so um, even if the unlikely chance that, that, that I don't win, I'll, I'll run again because it's about voting for not the party, but voting for someone who is going to have a plan to improve our lives, improve the quality of life and bring opportunities and value to our community, something that we've been missing for a very long time. You know, um, I get all that. I get all that. Um, I had to, hold on, I got, let me put my notes over here. Oh, I, I know what I was going to ask you. I saw your video on YouTube. You took a, you took a stroll through the city. Yeah. You showed the burnt out cars, a lot of the, lot of the bat, uh, rough things in the city. You showed Maxine's uh, mansion. I believe that's Hancock Park, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. But also, she got some... She throwing mud too. Uh, you got your baby mama issues. You've been sued for child support. I, got, I hate to say this, but what black man have it? Um, you, you're supposed to got a, a dishonorable discharge. I, and I saw you also threaten to sue behind that, okay? Uh, tell me about that. Well, we, did, we didn't threaten to sue. We did sue Maxine because she knows I didn't get a dishonorable discharge. She knows I took an administrative separation and it was a general under honorable conditions because I wanted to get involved in politics. Now, somebody who was a representative in Congress, they should know to go do your fact checking. And even when it comes to the, the child support, yeah, I got sued for a woman who thought her child was mine. And I took a lot of DNA tests and I got railroaded by the system. They stopped telling me to come to court after I, you know, showed my proof uh, the first time when they had me take DNA tests. And then I turned around and I sued the agency as well. So I mean, yeah, you know, as a black man, we go through a lot of stuff, especially as a black man in the military. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't know what to say. I have a lot of issues, but what politician don't? But I think here's the deal. You can talk about somebody's child support, and we can talk about how broken the system is and how it's used to target black men and keep black men out the home. We can talk about military service, and we can talk about the types of discharge that a person and gets. And it's easy to say, oh, you got a dishonorable discharge and spread rumors when you know it's not true. But when you sit in politics for over 44 years, you know you have a lot of skeletons in your closet as well. Now, if we start exposing Maxine Waters for who she is, I'm pretty sure it'll blacken both eyes because for one, she's not from South Central Los Angeles. Two, she's supposed to be married to Sid Williams, but when she sit up on a House Judiciary Committee or the House Finance Committee, it says MS Waters. She doesn't even recognize the fact that she's married. Um, we could talk about the many of mansions and properties that she has in, you know, throughout the United States. We can talk about the, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that she has in Russian investments. We can talk about the amount of corruption that, he's, that she's had um, in the last 44 years, the five times she's been labeled the most corrupt politician in the United States. And so, By who? you know, mudslinging wasn't the best choice for her at, now, at this point. Who labeled her, who labeled her that, that uh, the most uh, corrupt politician? Uh, it will be citizensforethics.org, which is a, a predominantly democratic organization. 
Okay. Now, um, it's a, I guess it's, it's a lot. Right now, I, I guess I'm looking at my phone. I'm looking at my chat room here from my phone. So, folks, if you have any questions you'd like to uh, like for me to ask uh, Joe Collins here today, please do so. We got a few minutes. We've only been here for a few minutes. Um, Joe, with the uh, situation that happened in in um, Kentucky, a lot of folks are concerned about black male Republicans. They felt we got they felt we got screwed over. And, and I know it's nothing personal with you, but you fit the description. Uh, black male, black male description. I mean, black male Republican. So that being the case, we know that my man was tied to Mitch McConnell. Um, he did a, he did a job, but he did his job to the best of his ability. We didn't get any justice in that situation. If came down to it, I mean, as a congressman, you have to make a lot of decisions that people above you and below you may not like. Do you think you can make those decisions, man? I mean, because when as anytime you are, anytime you a boss or run anything, people may not understand your decision making process. And you got donors, you got people to give you money that you have to um, not really adhere to because your main focus is the community, but we all know that that ain't always the case. So how do you, um, how do you fight off that, that the, the, the lobbyists, the, um, the, the big oil, the, uh, the various people that come, come at you with different types of, uh, and I need favors, man. I need things done. You know, they, they, nobody gives you money for your campaign without expecting anything in return. Yep, and and you know what? And that's, that's a big issue that we have right now. And I haven't got any big money from anybody. I mean, we've done a very good job of raising money, but my money comes from people. I have no packs. I have no anything. But in the case of Breonna Taylor, you know, our hearts go out to our family and everything. I think one of the biggest issues was the, the was the transparency, right? And they were not putting a lot of things on the table when it comes to allowing us to know the information that transpired whenever, you know, the door was kicked in and she was shot. I think it was terrible what happened, uh, which is why Rand Paul introduced the bill to get rid of the no-knock warrants and everything. But the, the attorney general of, uh, of Kentucky, he should have done an absolute better job with transparency. He should have done an absolute better job with allowing information to get out, especially after um, after the, the, the prosecution moved forward with the investigation. But one thing that we have in the black community is this thing that, oh, we hear the information now we autom automatically want action. I saw it in the John Kaziz case. Um, and I saw it on a lot of other cases when people were killed by cops, George Floyd. I went to Minneapolis, we marched against police brutality, but we also welled on sorry politicians who refused to create legislation that's gonna improve our lives. And we actually was one of the catalysts to ensuring that the other three cops were arrested and the, the main cop charges were actually put to where they were supposed to be uh, before we came home. We also worked with the, the mayor to look into the records of cops. And I'm gonna be honest, we got over 55 cops indicted, but it wasn't a Republican that let the cop off. It was Jackie Lacey, um, the DA who started letting cops go. You know, so a lot of times people think that Black Republicans are the problem. But if we look, just like you said, our city's been ran by Democrats for a very long time. And that's since 1963, 1964. And these have been Black Democrats and some have been Latino Democrats. And it has never been a Republican, you know, running our community, making major decisions for anything that's been happening. So unfortunately, the, the fear that people has is the fear that the media is carrying with this misinformation that they've been giving out. And so... At, for us, we have to use the spirit of discernment to recognize that we are, we have been our worst enemies for a very long time. Now, I work with the sheriff's department to ensure that the, the sheriffs that, you know, are involved in certain issues are getting prosecuted at the, at, at the maximum extent, as well as not letting too much information out that's going to jeopardize the uh, investigation from each individual officers. But it's not black Republicans that are letting um, people off the hook is actually the people who we've been voting in our office for a very long time that are letting people off the hook, allowing our cities to be in the ruins that has been in for a long time. Okay. I got a question from one but of you my guys. But you can't find me. Okay. I got a question from one of my guys here. Bernard Smith says, uh, are you for, are you for basic, uh, universal income? Um, 
if he could describe what basic universal income is, then I can tell you if I'll be for I think that was something that uh, one of the presidential candidates was offering like uh, $2,000 a month for every American to offset the, uh, the uh, rate of inflation and have a more of a balance of equality for when it comes to income and equality. Yeah, so I would say before, like just, just, just giving it a, like a common sense answer, I understand like the issues that are going on when it comes to the, the income versus cost of living, but everyone wants the income, but nobody wants to attack the challenge of the cost of living, right? And that's the cost of development, um, especially in California. So what happens with the cost of development is the state put a lot of restrictions on what developers can and can't do and where they can and can't build. They take the cost and they hand it down to the people who are gonna be buying that building, or they take the cost and hand it down to the people who are gonna be living or residing in those residents that they're building. And so unfortunately, when the state, um, through all these, all these different programs, increase the cost for development, the, the cost is handed down to the people who live in the community. And we can couple that along with the amount of taxes that we have to pay. We pay an extraordinary amount of taxes, whether you're a citizen or whether you're a business owner, um, you're gonna pay a lot of taxes. And we've been paying taxes without being represented. Uh, and they had the thing back in the day said, no taxation without representation. And so we have to be able to attack the state and get them back in line when it comes to the federal constitution with taxes, but we also have to start attacking these restrictions that we have on development so we can lower the cost of living. Also, we have to start getting quality jobs back into the community. Now, the biggest issue that I have when it comes to um, UBIs or this proposed $15 minimum wage outside of the tax bracket that you move up to whenever you get a higher pay is that you're telling me that people who work at McDonald's, people who work at, at Walmart should subsequently get the same type of pay of somebody who has a, a four year degree or have experience to work at a corporation where they actually are utilizing the knowledge and the skills that they've personally gained throughout their years to work at a certain job. And I think the, the disparities will come um, on that level. So for me, what I would do is I would increase the amount of quality jobs, quality paying businesses in our community while attacking the cost of living in, in California. And I will hope that every other state could grasp onto that concept because it's not the income uh, equality that's the problem, it's the high cost of living. All right, uh, Shabika Brown asks, uh, what are your plans for ensuring that more minorities who are small business owners can access capital and funding um, since many, since many were not given the, the uh, forgivable PPP, PPP loans. Yeah, and that, and that was a huge issue. I was really upset about that. Um, what we have to do is we have to get up on our financial literacy. Financial literacy is something that I'm actually working on bringing back to the community right now, um, as well as uh, I just hired a guy on my team from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to start teaching businesses how to start businesses one from A to Z and also how to get more money for your businesses as a small business utilizing government loans. But I think one of the biggest issues that we have in our community when it comes to small businesses is people um, create a, it's not, they have a small business, but they work in a small business. So in essence, they're creating another job for themselves. Now, the idea of creating a business or a company is not for you can work for that company, it's to create that company, get the ground level worked out and start hiring people who went to college to manage business, allow them to manage that business while you work on starting another company somewhere else, starting another company somewhere else and starting other companies um, across the United States and franchising your own business. This is a lesson that we're never taught. So I know ideally is. Uh, we're taught to start a small business and work in that small business, but that's not what that was uh, meant for unless it's something that you absolutely love. Well, in that case, then we have to increase your level of knowledge when it comes to finance and, and, and how to run a business. All right. Um, my guest right now is Joe Collins. He's running for Maxine's Water Seat uh, for the 43rd Con Congressional District here in Los Angeles. Um, we're not grilling him. We got some questions for him. We can't, we're not going to grill you. We're going to do that questions, though, okay? We got a bunch of questions. When I first saw your billboards on, you got, I think you got a billboard right there on, on uh, Century and Western. I'm like, what mm -hmm. is he thinking about? Okay? That's my first question. A black Republican yeah. wants to run in a black district that's 99% Democratic, okay? I was my friend. Before I met you, before, before I met you at your office over on, on Western, I was like, what was, what's on his mind? And when I, I, my buddy Henry, Henry, uh, Henry Washington, 
invited me to a situation you did over there. I went by there for a minute. And we didn't get a chance to talk, okay? Um, but I, I've, I've had conversations about you from various people who support you. There are You do have some supporters out here. Uh, one of my boys, uh, Cozy, he's a supporter. Henry is a, is a supporter. Uh, everybody on my line is um, not a supporter, but I got to ask questions anyway because that's what we're here for. Um, what is, um, without legis legislation, le legis legislation experience, how will you introduce legislation uh, that would that would uh, that would be on the leg legislative agenda? Yes, that's a really good question, and I think the answer to that question is, you know, sometimes you don't have to have legislative experience in order to get legislation passed. That's what that's what mentors are meant to help you do, and. I mean, like, if we're being honest, nobody has any experience of doing anything until they actually get into the position. Now, for me, right in legislation experience, I understand how legislation is written. And legislation is written in the same type of, uh, in a same type of grammatical fashion that military uh, instructions are written. And I've been an expert at writing military instructions for uh, a very long time. If you look at the responsibility of the, the, the Congress and the Senate, um, everything they do, everything the government does is done in military fashion. So uh, I can say I have no experience in being in Congress, but I can also say I have a lot of experience of doing the same things that Congress does when it comes to when it comes to leading, when it comes to writing uh, different bills. And we also have to understand that your first two years in Congress, you're not writing uh, legislation. Now, you could petition to have legislation removed and get legislation put off the books. But my first two years in office, um, my primary focal point is going to be on rebuilding the community, bringing jobs, opportunities, uh, rebuilding our schools. A lot of people get into these legislative positions and they forget all about the communities. I mean, let's look at, you know, for an example, let's look at AOC. Now, she's very uh, prominent, she's very visible, but when it comes to her community, she hasn't done anything for her community yet. I know Amazon was trying to put like 40,000 jobs, but she ran Amazon out. And so I don't want to be like her. I don't want to be like any other legislator. What I want to do is create a collaborative effort between myself and the community to find out what we need because I absolutely want to build this community. I'm from here. My grandfather had one of the largest churches, Ambassadors of Christ, before mega churches was a thing. And he would always tell me, you take care of your people, you take care of your community. Now, regardless of Republican or Democrat, these are values that I hold true. When I joined the military, I didn't fight just for black people or just for white people. I fought for the entire United States. And so this is the, the mindset that we have to get into when it comes to um, you know, when we further our career in politics or when it comes to creating legislation or taking care of our communities. Uh, who's, your, who's your grandfather again? His name was uh, Bishop Joe Collins Sr. from Ambassadors of Christ Missionary Baptist Church. Where was that? It was on 104th in Normandy. Okay, okay. Not far from where you're, uh, uh, Normandy, 104th of Normandy. Okay, okay. All right. It was right next to the house. Actually, the house that I grew up in, uh, was owned by my grandfather. He owned the majority of that block before he passed away. All right, we got another question for you. Uh, Shamika Brown wants to know, do you agree with Proposition 22? Um, is that the, uh, that's the proposition for the ride share, right? I believe so. Yeah, I, you know what? I believe everybody has a right to own a business, create a business, or become a contractor in our own respects. And I don't think that's a, something that the government should be able to legislate. Um, for me, the reason why I'm thinking that a lot of these things are going through is to, create, is to generate more revenue for the state of California because they have been absolutely terrible with managing a budget. Um, so I would never support a Proposition 22 because uh, we have to look at it from a from a contractor's point of view as well as a uh, company's point of view. Now, if a person wants to contract and work for an organization for a certain amount of time, knowing the risk that they take, then that should, by all means, be their rights. But when you have to force someone uh, to be able to do something that's repugnant to the Constitution, uh, I'm, a, I'm really big on the Constitution, and I don't think anybody should follow any statutes or codes that are repugnant to the Constitution, because God grants us the right to our freedoms, to live our life how we want to without the interference of the government. And um, and this is a right that, you know, I've already taken a note to fight. 
I think that the state of California has to start figuring out different ways to start increasing the revenue without destroying the, the quality of life of the people who live in our district. So, you know, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not a fan of uh, Proposition 22. I'm not a fan of the AB5 that strips the right for people to be able to uh, freelance work. I'm not a fan of anything that the government forces you to do. All right, let's get personal for a minute. How old are you? I'm about to be 35. Okay, you married? I'll be 35 next month. You got a, you I'm ready? divorced. You got, a, you got a first lady already? <laughs> no, I'm divorced. I, um, so here's the story. I got I got divorced whenever whenever I was in Iraq. You know, my, my ex-wife, she cheated on me, got pregnant by somebody else. When I got oh. back, um, we, we, we actually got divorced. And um, I have a set of twins and I have a, set of, uh, I have a son as well. And um, I, I'm not with their mothers either because, you know, I took my military career more serious than I, I took the relationship. In my opinion, I feel like when, because my grandfather always brought us up, like if a man don't work, he, he doesn't eat and he's supposed to be ahead of the household. So being ahead of the household doesn't mean that I have to sit at home all day and be up under the woman. That means I have to go out and I have to go get the bacon. I got to be successful so I can be able to provide for my family. And so that was my logic. That was my upbringing. And so that's it. that was more important to me than, um, you know, being up under my woman 24-7. And at the end of the day, I feel like God has um, someone for somebody. So uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dating at the moment, I'm not looking at the moment. I'm focused solely on my career. And as I move through my career, I believe that God will, you know, bring that person that he wants me to be with and we'll have a great relationship. Okay. All right. So you have three kids all together. Very, I have four children. Four children, okay. Uh, I got four children. All right. Um, boy, one of my guys is getting he he's getting a little he getting a little nasty over here. Like every other Republican, could you care less about poverty, people in poverty? Um. Actually, that's a hard statement to make because. The majority of the cities that have a lot of poverty have been ran by Democrats for a very long time. But I'll tell you this, if we, if we want to talk about poverty and my stance on poverty, we've done uh, on-the-spot higher affairs. We actually have another one coming up tomorrow. You, if you drive through the community and see our tents, more than likely we're doing food drives. Um, we've been working with legislators to, to try to find uh, you know, ways that we can house homeless. We've been bringing quality jobs back to the district. So poverty is on the top of my list. But to say that it's a Republican platform not to care about policy is to say that we've been ignoring the fact that we've been electing the same elected officials in office for, you know, 10, 20 and 30 years who have failed to even do anything about poverty outside of research and development. When I lived in San Diego, the mayor of San Diego, they gave him a huge budget to be able to combat poverty. And I worked with them. And the only thing that we did was we did account. And we counted the amount of people who were living on the streets and we asked them what the circumstances was. When it comes to improving the lives of people who live in our communities, especially black and brown communities, we don't have any of that. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let me, let me, let me, uh, I'm, I'm reading my, I'm, I'm reading my phone. I'm trying to pick a, uh, uh, some, some good questions here. I'm getting I, I think all the questions huh? are good. Uh, I think all the questions are good. I, I do this all day, every day when I'm in the street. I can imagine, Doc. I can imagine. I can imagine. So you never run for office. You never held an office before, right? No, no. I got out the military as a presidential candidate to get involved in politics. That was my opportunity to learn a lot about uh, being in office and learn a lot about campaigning, being a lot, learning a lot about how things work in Washington, D.C. So I was a presidential candidate. And um, I learned enough, and we dropped that race back in, uh, in early 2019. I didn't have a shot at being a presidential candidate, but I did, um, you know, learn a lot about, you know, politics, how to run for office, how to campaign. Um, and, and I learned about the dirty things that goes on in Washington, D.C. All right. Um, I got a young lady on the line right now. She's in my chat room. Her name is Kenya Tippy. She wants to know how old you are. He's 35, darling. He's 35, single, no <laughs> kids. Um, you know, trying to try, trying to run some things. So, um, wait, he ran for president. No, you ran for president of the United States. Yeah, I was a pres I was a presidential candidate. Yes, that's how I was able to get out of the military. They gave me the option because uh, I was real serious about politics in 2016. They I, they always talked about millennials are lazy. Millennials don't do this. Millennials don't do that. And I'm a millennial, you know. 
And I got really sick of it as well as, you know, we would come to the table with issues and nobody would hear our issues. Nobody would hear anything that we had to do. And I know being in the military, I served with a lot of people who were millennials, Generation Z, and Y. And I'm going to tell you, we did more between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. than most people did in their entire lives, you know, during the day. And so I thought that was a, a false fallacy, but I also recognize that we don't have young people standing up and taking leadership roles and trying to take responsibility to be the change that we want to see in our community. So, yeah, I became a presidential candidate. The military, they gave me the option to um, stay in the military and drop politics or pursue politics and and get out the military. And so they helped me get out the military through the administrative separation. All right, Eddie Goodman wants to know, do you support term limits for Congress and the Senate? Uh, absolutely, I support term limits around the, around the board, even when it comes to uh, city officials and the city council, the mayor, I support term limits, period. When people are in politics for, in, for too long, they become the epitome of what we don't need in the United States. And I don't think that when they wrote the Constitution, they wrote the Constitution with the idea of people remaining in politics for 10, 15, 20, and 30 years. It's, that's terrible. What we need to be doing is we need to be training younger people to get involved in politics so we can easily pass the torch to someone who wants to see our community continue to do better. And that's something that, you know, we've been uh, let down on. That's an idea that's been failed for a very long time. You know, I, I read today earlier that um, Ice Cube sent his um, contract for Black America to the Democrats and to the Republicans, and apparently Trump has taken it and modified it and included it in his platinum plan for African Americans. Are you familiar with that? Yep, I, I actually am. I've been trying to uh, get with Ice Cube. And, and, and sit down and talk with him for, you know, about two or three weeks now. But since he's so new to politics, he's been receiving, he was, he's been receiving a lot of backlash for that. But, um, I mean, I mean, yeah, the, the president, I wouldn't say that necessarily that the Republican Party, but the president actually, because he's a businessman, picked it up. And, and I think he included some of those parts into um, his plan. Uh, to rebuild and revitalize the black community. And I thought it was a pretty good plan. I, I went to Atlanta and I listened to him talk about that plan um, because everybody knows I'm about economic development. Everybody knows this is not a secret. And so the White House sent me an invitation and I absolutely went. I wanted to see for myself and I, I was pretty impressed. Now, the issue that I think we're going to have with that is the amount of corruption that we have within our communities. They're not going to let this plan get back to our communities and say, oh, he lied and he didn't really do this. He didn't really do that. And so that's my biggest concern. They're gonna to lie to us to continue to take the money that has been implemented to improve our communities and, and continue to, to squander that away and steal it and do whatever they want with it without improving our lives. Now, you know, um, a lot of what's in Ice Cube's uh, contract with Black America is already on the desk of Mitch McConnell, sitting right there right now. A lot of the things, a lot of the things that's in that contract is sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. Mitch McConnell has approximately uh, 400 potential bill that was passed by Congress that, would, that needs a vote in the Senate to uh, move forward, and it goes nowhere. Now, my question is, even if Donald Trump was at what's going won the election and said he was going to give us the 500, 500 billion? 500 million, 500 billion, okay? Billion would it be, yeah. 500 billion dollars for, uh, um, for the five hundred billion dollars, wouldn't Mitch McConnell and the Senate have to sign off on it? Yeah, they can sign off on it. Or he's going to pass it through executive order. One thing that I do know about this guy from watching how he moves is uh, he's going to do what he want to do, and he don't care what anybody thinks about him. He's going to do it. So if he want to pass a five hundred dollar, five hundred billion dollar plan to rebuild our communities and and put all those things into into action, he's going to do it regardless of what anybody says. You know what, one of the biggest things, I'm sorry, one of the biggest things that I've been, and, and the Republican Party doesn't, uh, they, they doesn't hear me, but the president does. One of the biggest things that we've been yelling for a very long time is you need to start getting into inner cities and actually talking about what you've been doing. Because a lot of people don't hear, you know, because he said, I'm gonna do, you know, opportunity zones so you can reinvest. He did it, but we don't see it because of corruption on city council. He said, I'm gonna, you know, fully fund HBCUs for eternity. and he did it, but we don't have HBCUs, which means there's a problem. We need to start creating avenues so we can start building historical black colleges and universities in, in, in our type of communities. Um, he says, you know, we're going to do criminal justice reform and we're going to, you know, counteract the, the crime bill. 
he's did it. But then again, there's a lot of people who don't know about it, so we can't utilize it. So we need him to start getting in and actually talking to us one-on-one -on -one, the same way he do the rallies like in Orlando and all these other places. He needs to come to the inner cities, come to the Chicago's, come to the L.A.'s, um, go to the, to, the, to the New York, the Bronx, and start having the same thing for us that he has for those other people. Do you really think he's a good president? Uh, I mean, like, what's the definition of a good president? You know, because I think that every single president has their flaws. They do a lot of, th I'm a critical person. I'll be honest yeah. with you. A lot of these presidents do a lot of things that I like and a lot of things that I don't like, you know? Um, so I believe that he's doing the best he can with the information that he has. I feel like he can put better people around him, like people from, you know, the inner cities who can tell him how black communities are, Latino communities are, instead of surrounding himself. Right, with people going to jail, though. Huh? All these people go to jail. I get indicted. Yeah, they, they, people to go and you get indicted. Yeah, well, they get indicted for lying to Congress or not snitching or they trying to find something. I mean, they, these people on both sides are doing the exact same thing. The only difference is the Republicans are going to jail and Democrats are covering up a lot of stuff. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline with, with Obama, with Joe Biden, with Hillary Clinton, with a lot of people who are sitting in Congress right now. Um, on a Democratic ticket for a lot of corruption that's been happening, but the media never talks about it. So I, I believe on both ends of the spectrum, there's a lot of crap going on. And I'll be honest, I, I'm not with it. I don't like it. Um, I just want to be able to utilize whatever bills and programs that, you know, these presidents put into law so we can start rebuilding our communities first. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because we've been forgotten about for a very long time. Uh, Bernard has a question here. Um, as much as Mr. Trump hates Auntie Maxine, why hasn't he endorsed you? He did. He did? Mm hmm He endorsed me like three days ago. Did he really? Is it, yeah. is it anywhere on video or is it just a letter or something or what? Yes, it's all, it's all over social media. That's the reason why that video we made when we went in front of Maxine Waters' house um, has gotten a lot of traction. Now, yeah, so, so yeah, he, he went around the whole entire Republican Party and endorsed me because of the work that we've been putting in community. Mind you, it's only on a small scale because I'm not sitting in office, but he did endorse me. Okay. All right. Now, well, some people feel that could be an endorsement or it could be a kiss of death. What you think about that? I mean, regardless of the fact, all we got to do is, is, is work hard, you know, where the people like it or not, we have to improve our communities and we have to vote for someone who has an agenda to improve our communities. Um, you know, unfortunately my opponent doesn't have an agenda and I think that she's been preaching a lot of hate and negativity for a very long time. So we're just trying to change our outlook on the way we see things. And, you know, we have to have allies on both sides. Right now we don't. So I think it would behoove us in order to vote for someone who is an ally on the other side to improve our communities. Now, you don't have to like the president, but support me in order to work with this man to improve our lives. All right. How, when he made that statement uh, to the white supremacist, stand down and stand by, how did you feel about that? Um, I think that he was talking about the Proud Boys. And I have a lot of friends who are Proud Boys, but they're not white supremacists. They're, you know, military veterans. There is a lot of Latinos and there's a lot of black people in the Proud Boys. Um, I think the white supremacist who they should have brought up was the, the, the KKK, um, Antifa, all these other organizations that has been actively destroying cities. Those are the white supremacist organizations that we need to get rid of. And they even, you know, they infiltrate Black Lives Matter and make Black Lives Matter movement um, sort of get a bad connotation because when we look at the people who are destroying the communities, those are, those are white folks. Those are not black people. I've yet to see a black person um, doing a, that amount of damage to any city uh, anywhere and from from um, Washington State, from uh, Minneapolis, from New York, even in LA, and we chased those guys out of the community. A lot of people were upset, but they got to understand these people are not from here. When we got the arrest report from the sheriff for the amount of people, the 67 people were arrested, they were all white people from out of town. Right. And I so know. I think that the organizations that he should have, um, you know, told to stand down were real white supremacist groups, not you know, it's, it's impossible to be a Latino white supremacist or a black white supremacist or uh, a white supremacist as a, as a military veteran um, when you actually see this stuff in, in person. And I was pretty disappointed. But the president has been condemning white supremacy since the, the 1980s. It's, it's well documented, but the media never pushes it. 
I mean, you can Google it and it'll pop up. The many times he said it in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. So I can understand how he gets fresher. Like, okay, you know what? If you want me to condemn a white supremacist group, tell me when. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is telling people that the protest has been peaceful protests. And I've seen this stuff firsthand. That stuff ain't peaceful. But they would never, they, they will pitch him ballpark questions, but they would never give Trump the same um, questions. <clears throat> Hold on one second. Go ahead. Do you say? Hey, baby. How you doing, my love? Yes, baby. Okay. Let me unlock the phone. Okay, baby. Give me give me a minute, and I'm gonna do it. Okay. All right. Love you too. Mwah. He a player, ladies. He a player. <laughs> <laughs> That was my daughter. <laughs> okay. Hey, sorry about that. I know how that go. Um, Kenya Tippy wants to know, do you work with Candace Owens? No, I don't even like Candace Owens. I think she's a smart woman, but anybody who continues to criminalize black people who are murdered by white people or murdered by cops, um, after you made a lot of money by talking about how these policies have destroyed our communities. I, I can't. I can't get with that. That's. I, I'm not a fan. She's a smart woman, but I think she could be smarter. Um, she does this stuff to to sell merchandise and to sell her platform. And I'm from South Central Los Angeles, and I think that what's the point of criminal justice reform just to turn around and criminalize people who are murdered when they're trying to get their life together just because they got a criminal background? So we already got into it, you know, plenty of times, and she does, she doesn't like me, and, and and vice versa. So that's a that's a hard no. Hey man. Um, Eddie Gibbons wants to know what's your thoughts on reparations? I think that reparations uh, could be ideal. Um, the biggest thing about reparations is that it, it would expose the truth about black people in America, right? And people hate hearing this. Um, Congress says that anything that they create, they control. So Congress created the word black to identify us as people of color. They created the word African American to identify us as people of color. They created Afro. Um, America to try to identify us. Um, the biggest issue that we have when it comes to reparations is the nationality aspect of um, handing out reparations. See, the Library of Congress teaches us that there are two types of black people, or people of color, whatever you want to call it, um, during the time of the transatlantic slave trade. You have people who are already here by way of migration through world travel, but you have people who are here um, by way of the slave trade. Now, history of the United States uh, from black people in our history book starts as a slave trade. They never talk about the people who the Indians refer to as the copper color people or the Moorish or the indigenous um, Aborigine people who were here prior to the slave trade. And so <clears throat> you would absolutely expose a fraud and start to reveal the real truth about black people in America once you start handing out reparations. But I think a nationality is um, something that I will fight for first and then we'll go with the reparations after that. And another thing, people think reparations um, you know, comes from the government and it doesn't. The reparations comes through the Department of Interior, the same place that give Indians reparations, the same place that grants Indians land. This is one of the reasons why Martin Luther King was killed. He would start talking about the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act, the government uh, instituted it for black people who were coming off slavery to be able to get their 40 acres in the meal or their land or whatever the government promised them. Now, what they did for us was they increased the cost um, to purchase the home. They said, yes, you can have it, but you got to pay for it. But we weren't making the amount of money uh, we needed to in order to purchase this. Meanwhile, they were um, using this to influence uh, people from other countries of, of white and Spanish descent to come over here, and they were giving them the land grants through the Homestead Act. When Martin Luther King started exposing this part of the fraud, he was murdered. <clears throat> That's a lot to take in. I understand that. Okay. All right. So nationality is absolutely important. After we get our nationality and we gain our rightful place in the United States, then we can move towards finding out how we're going to get reparations. They have money for both sides. Um, have you been on Fox News yet? I've been on Fox News like five times in the last three days. And so I probably put it at eight times all together since I've been in this race. I didn't like you over there. Uh, they like me sometimes. They don't like me sometimes. I'm, I'm going to tell you this. It's hard working with journalists because they always want to get the aha, I got you moment. You know, like I have something to hide or something, but I, but I don't. I speak my mind and I speak my truth. And at the end of the day, just like everybody else, I have to live with the consequences of decisions that I make, um, whether I make them nationally or in private, just like everybody else does. 
But as long as I'm telling the truth, I mean, you can't never catch me or nothing because they go back and look, everything that I said has been the truth. I'm checking you out. I'm listening to you. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty versed in what you, some of the things you're talking about. Not everything, but some of the things you're talking about. And it's, it seems like you know what you, what you know. What you, it seems like you know what you're talking about. Although some of my guys on the uh, on the chat room tend to disagree. Uh, I may have to disagree with them on some, especially with Martin Luther King. That's why he was killed because he was he was um, <clears throat> he was going after the money. He was about to start talking about some economics, and that wasn't going to fly at that time. And we got to remember, LGB, uh, um, Lyndon B. Johnson was a racist dude. The only reason why he allowed Martin Luther King to pass that civil rights bill, because I quote, these uppity niggers get a little political power and they starting to come get an uprising. Let's give these niggers something to calm them down. And so they thought that this, this bill was going to calm them down. And it did, but they had to kill Martin Luther King in order to ensure that they never had any more uprising. But also they made it seem like they did so much for black people with the civil rights bill. Um, that black people start switching over to the Democratic Party. And ideally, you know, meeting with some of the civil rights activists during that time, they said that he should have fought for human rights first and then civil rights second, because civility wasn't the problem. We were creating our own cultures. We had our own community, our own businesses. And, uh, but we were, we were not being treated like human. And part of that is because of the Dred Scott case, which says people who consider themselves black or, or African-American or three-fourths human. And uh, yeah. Also the Constitution mentioned that as well. All right, so, um, we got about five minutes left. Chat room, uh, Eddie says, make a come with a counterclaim. I don't know what you're talking about, Eddie. Um, I got about, about about five minutes left. Anything else that you want to clarify with the people before we go? Um, just keep coming to my events. We do our food drives at our office on 105th and Western every Saturday. We've been giving away quality product. Um, we have a job fair tomorrow. We're hiring on the spot. So if you guys need work, come to our hiring fairs. This is what we do. And uh, like I said before, I don't want this race, even, even when I'm elected, I don't want this to be all about me and what Joe Collins want to do. This has to be a collaborative effort. So I think one thing that we have to do is put our personal prejudices aside and start working together to come up with ideas and ways that we can improve our community. I have never leave an idea off the table. Um, what I like is to have a collaborative effort, which means you email me the type of idea that you want. Let's come up with a plan and let's see if it's a viable, effective plan. And let's get it into action. Um, at the moment, especially in Los Angeles, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, we're all struggling together. There is no better person than anybody else. And so if we want to improve our lives, we're going to have to put our personal prejudice aside and we have to start working together to improve our community. And if you haven't been living the life that you want to, you have to start looking on a local level and a federal level who you've been voting for. Because let's be honest, people who sit in Congress and the Senate are the people who make the laws. Now, if you have nobody railroading for the laws that we need to be passed, the bills that we need to be passed are going to either benefit our community or remove the ones that has not been beneficial to our communities, you're going to have to get somebody new in there. Um, 29 years doing the same thing is a very long time, and we have got little improvement. Uh, and on, a, on another note, it's time for change. Two quick questions. Will there be a debate between you and Maxine Waters before the election? We sent her a, a debate request, and she's ignored it. Um, instead of debating that she's gotten on the radio and talked a lot of trash about me, I mean, which is fine. It's America. I fought for this country so she can uh, enjoy her freedom of speech. But uh, I, I highly doubt she's going to want to debate me. I have a lot of questions to ask, mainly how come you left a lot of veterans uh, homeless on the streets when it's your obligation and duty to take care of those people? Uh, and Next question. If the, Democrat, if the Democrats were to support you, would you consider being a Democrat to be uh, for that seat, for that same seat? No, absolutely not. It's, it's, it shouldn't be um, anybody's goal to change anybody's political party preference because that's their own ideology, that's their own opinions. Um, for me, the reason why I could not go back to the Democratic Party is looking at the history of the Democratic Party and what they've done to us for a very long time. And I tell people this all the time, the name of the game has never changed. The only thing that's changed is the way the game is played. And we look at the policies that have been passed by Democrats, they, they wrap it up in a nice package and make it seem like it's gonna benefit us, then bam, it's a crime bill that gives cash grants and, and, and incentives for incarcerating blacks and Latinos. And this has been going on for a long time, even when you talk about the child support laws, you talk about three strikes, all of these things, all of these bills that Democrats say, we wanna get hard on crime, hard on law enforcement, they pass bills and we're directly affected by all of this stuff, even when it comes to improving our communities. And so, I mean, unless these lawmakers start removing the laws that have been placed 
um, to attack our communities and ensure that our communities stay impoverished, I, I would never be a Democrat. And even if they do, looking at the history of the amount of slavery, the amount of killings that they did to our people, I, 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 my convictions, I can't do it. It's, that's not going to work for me. All right, folks. This is the end of the show. My guest today is Joe Collins. He's running for, is it Joe or Joseph? Just Joe. My dad is Joseph. I'm just Joe. Joe Collins, he's running for the 43rd District, the Congressional District, uh, currently held by Maxine Waters. He's a young candidate. He's got a lot of ideas. Um, Joe, I wish you all luck in the world. If you don't make it this time, I'll see you again. Tell your dad I said, what's up? Thank you. All right. <laughs> all right, I got you. All right, peace.